Chapter 8 Alexander Izvolsky Hero and Villain Although preparations for the London Olympic Games and introduction of a bill to introduce an old age pension proved a welcome distraction in 1908, try as he may, the new Prime Minister could not avoid the prickly issue of Russia. Following the signing of the Anglo-Russian Convention the previous year, plans were set for what was billed as family visits between King Edward VII and Tsar Nicholas at Reval, now Tallinn in Estonia, but was in fact the next step in the secret elite plan. The visit upset many sections of British society who objected strenuously to any association to Tsarist Russia and its repressive regime. Asquith had barely taken office before he was being asked questions in Parliament that should have seriously embarrassed the Liberal Prime Minister. How could the King go to Russia when 100 members of the first Duma Parliament and 50 members of the second had been sent to Siberia or were held in prisons like common criminals pending trials that might never take place. And what of the officials and unofficial murders that still continue while the perpetrators went unchecked? In the first two years of so-called constitutional reforms, 1,780 people had been executed and 15,557 imprisoned. British trade unions, the Labour Party, churchmen, and Asquith's own Liberal Party, own Liberal Party, were united in their disgust at the vicious repression of Russia's early attempts at democracy, but to no avail. What had Milner urged? What had Milner, what had Milner urged? Disregard the screamers. The new prime minister. The new Prime Minister curtly reminded members of Parliament that it was not their business to make allegations about the internal conditions and policies of the foreign nation. Gray lied in the Commons on the 28th of May when asserting MPs that no new convention or treaty is under discussion, nor is it intended to initiate any negotiations for one during the King's visit. Although Gray claimed that the visit was purely dedicated by family affection and without any suspicion of politics attached to it, his own permanent undersecretary at the Foreign Office accompanied the King. The royal visit to Reval would lead to the realization of a scheme that the secret elite had devised years before, the encirclement of Germany. Protests in Parliament continued, but the Relugas III did not buckle under pressure. When Asquith was asked if he was aware that the Tsar was to be accompanied by Peon Stolimpin, the Prime Minister, and Izvolsky, his Foreign Secretary, while King Edward had no Minister of the Crown with him, he feigned not to know the arrangements made by the Russian government. It was unconstitutional for the king to discuss foreign affairs with other nations without the presence of a minister responsible to parliament. Rules, regulations, pre precedent. What did these matters? What did these matter to the secret elite in the pursuit of their great cause? They lived, they lied before the visit took place and lied after the Entente was agreed. The Entente was agreed. Despite the moral, political, and constitutional objections, the king and his entourage sailed off to the beautiful Estonian town that had never experienced such a profusion of royalty since Peter the Great captured it from Sweden some 200 years before. Both royal families, the Saxe Colburns and the Romanovas, were in full array, and the two days of talks were interspersed with banquets on board and royal yachts. In the real world, protests continued but were studiously ignored. 
To the embarrassment of the liberal government, the king had made an admiral of the young and growing fleet that the secret elite were encouraging Russia to rebuild after the Tsushima disaster. Passive, pros passive massive profits were accrued by British and French bankers, and King Edward greased the path to his close friend for his close friends and secret elite financiers, Sir Ernest Cassell, to be granted an interview with the Tsar. It was an abuse of his friendship, but the king had to repay his debt somehow. One positive action stemmed from the meeting at Revol. King Edward responded to an appeal from the Rothschilds brothers to speak to the Tsar about protection for Russian Jews under threat from brutal pogroms. He did but little change inside the anti-Semitic court. King Edward was accompanied by Admiral Jackie Fisher, the first Sea Lord, General Sir John French, Inspector General of Army, and Sir Charles Harding, the secret elite's lead dip, leading diplomat and the man who pulled the strings in the foreign office. The rabid, the rabidly anti-German Admiral Fisher and John French had discussed military and naval actions at the Committee of Imperial Defense in the presence of Asquith, Gray, Haldane, and Lord Escher and the king's entourage was nothing more than a select subcommittee of the cabal. Fisher urged King Edward to support him in his plans to crush the German fleet before it could close the Baltic to the Royal Navy. On the Bay of Reval on the 9th of June, 1908, bathed in brilliant sunshine, the Imperial royal yachts surrounded by British and German warships set an immerse an impressive scene. Both Tsar and King spoke in English and emphasized the good relations that had replaced the coolness between the two countries in past years. After lunch, King Edward retired to the cabin to his cabin with Premier Stolypin who for a long private consultation. After lunch, King Edward retired to his cabin with Premier Stoli Pin for a long private consultation. As the New York Times reported the following day, nothing has been published. Edward held private talks with the Russian Prime Minister, not his cousin the Tsar, on matters that have been kept secret. There was no official communique. Admiral Fisher and French and General French held private talks with Prime Minister Stolypin and Foreign Minister Izvolsky. These two went these two went unreported. Significantly, the Russians were known to be concerned about Germany's potential dominance of the Baltic, and Stolypin desperately wanted British support to prevent the Baltic becoming a German lake. This was the trip that Edward Gray had assured deeply concerned MPs was purely dictated. This was the trip that Edward Gray had assured deeply concerned MPs was purely dictated by family affection and had no suspicion of policies attached to it. Revol was the final piece in a complex diplomatic strategy that started in Copenhagen with King Edward's loyal agents then Russian ambassador to Denmark, Alexander Ivolsky. It was there in 1904-1905 that Ivolsky had, by his own account, long interviews with the king in which they settled the basis of the Anglo-Russian entente. Shortly before the visit to Reval, the king and his entourage met secretly with Ivolsky in the Bohemian Spa Resort of Marienbad ostensibly to take the waters like tourists. Days later, Zvolsky moved on to Revol and was present there to greet the king on his arrival. He engaged in the public charades of being introduced to a King Edwards and his team as if for the first time. When Stolypin met 
first with the King and then with Fisher, French and Harding. He seems to have been unaware that Izvolsky had been at the Merriam Bad or that their discussions had previously been rehearsed. Izvolsky, like his French counterpart, the Del Casse, was truly King Edward's man. Germany viewed this family gathering that justified suspicion. When did the Anglo-Russian discussions what did the Anglo-Russian discussions really mean? Were they a cover for a secret alliance that would snare Germany between antagonistic nations? What were the unspoken subtexts? Germany's newspaper declared that a mighty coalition had been formed against the Triple Alliance. It was a view shared by Belgian diplomats who recognized the king, that King Edward had isolated the Kaiser and that his new Triple Entente was un united by a common hatred for Germany, all of which was repeatedly denied. Edward Grey claimed that Britain had simply removed any danger of a breach of peace either between us and France or us and Russia. It was, it was about friendship and was not intended to isolate Germany. It was about friendship and was not intended to isolate Germany. Furthermore, Grey denied that Germany was isolated as she had two great friends in the Triple Alliance, Austria and Italy. His shameless protestations, protestations polished a veneer of innocence over the secret elite triumph. Germany was now surrounded. The Tsar made a reciprocal visit to Britain in 1909 in the company of Alexander Zvolsky, Public reaction was so heated that he dared not leave the safety of his yacht. Sandar, guarded as he was by two dreadnoughts and 200 detectives, he was mightily impressed when he received the northern squadron of the British fleet off Spithead from the safety of his imperial yacht. 153 combat ships were arranged in three parallel lines in a stunning show of naval power. The subtext was clear. Russia didn't have a fleet capable of defeating Germany, but her new friend Britain did. What did it tell us about the extent to which the secret elite were prepared to go to isolate Germany? Public opinion mattered not. Liberal values were expendable. Human decency and democracy ignored. Their agents agreed that their agents agreed the secret alliances and closed the net. The deed was done. All that now remained before war broke out was careful preparation and a suitable excuse. Q. Alexander Zvolsky, the Russian, was first and foremost the king's chosen man. and He had elevated from the relative obscurity of the Danish court in Copenhagen to the royal palaces of St. Petersburg on Edward's, on Edward's personal recommendation. The secret elite controlled him and their large bribes on the road to his lavish lifestyle. Izvolsky was central to the successful convention between Britain and Russia by which their major differences in Afghanistan, Tibet, and Persia had been settled. He even managed to conclude a Russian agreement with Japan to define the spheres of influence between them and China. For a foreign minister of a country that had recently been crushed by Japan, these were great achievements. Achievements. They happened so readily because every action he took harmonized with the secret elite's policy and it ensured that Russia and, Jap and Japan would act together as a bulwark, a bulwark, a bulwark against Germany expansion in the Far East. Izvolsky's achievements was entirely predicated upon meeting the needs of his British masters. He formally closed the chapter on Russian imperial designs in the East and turned St. Petersburg towards a new era of harmony with Britain. Precisely as the secret elite had dictated, Izvolsky's next move came 
in came in the Balkans, in the Balkans, and it stirred more than just controversy. That backward corner of Southeast Europe had long been troubled, had been troubled ground, and in the early years of the 20th century, the physical clash of cultures, language, and religions, and long-standing animosities had deliberately pressed into intrigue and war. The Ottoman Empire had ruled the Balkans for at least 400 years, but the deterioration of its control was underlinked by a bankrupt government in Constantinople. Constantinople. A strong Ottoman Empire had acted as a barrier to ambitious European expansion, but the fast evaporating remnant of the great heyday of Ottoman rule signaled an outburst of calls for annexation independence and political realignments by the numerous small nations comprising the Balkans. The first element in what was to provide the slow-burning fuse for the First World War began in 1908, thanks directly to Alexander Zvolsky. Austria-Hungary had held administrative control of the Balkan province of Bosnia-Herzegovina since the Treaty of Berlin in 1878, and in the intervening 30 years had built roads, schools, hospitals, Serbs, Serbs who comprised 42% of the population resented Austria rule, Austrian rule, but it was popular with a significant number of Muslims and Croats. In October of 1908, Austria's decision to formally annex Bosnia-Herzegovina and bring it under direct rule from Vienna, caused indignation both inside the province and most vocally in neighboring Serbia, Russia, in neighboring Serbia. Russia had long claimed to be the protector of the Slavic peoples in the Balkans, and such a bold and, prov and provocative move could not have been taken place could not have taken place without her agreement. So what happened? Just days after the, his diplomatic intrigues with the secret elite at Marion Bad and Revol, Izvolsky sent the Austrian foreign ministry, Count Alois Arenthal, a memorandum. He proposed a meeting to discuss changes in the 1878 Treaty of Berlin without the knowledge and approval of the Tsar or the Russian government. He agreed to an Austro-Hungarian annexation of Bosnia-Herzegovina in return for a promise that Russian tr interests in the Straits in Constantinople would be supported by the Austrians. From the start of the discussions, it was evident that Count Orenthal was acting in concert with his own government. Izvolsky was not. On the 16th of September 1908, they met in secret at Buchlaw in Morovia. The Austrian minister was accompanied by diplomats and foreign, and foreign office officials from Vienna. Izvolsky had no one on his side to witness the talks and no minutes were made during a meeting that lasted six hours. It was a very bold and dangerous move for any Russian politician to make on his own, but Volsky was not entirely on his own. The British Foreign Office certainly knew what was being proposed before the top secret talks were concluded. Indeed, it was claimed that Austria's, Austrians had been encouraged by the British Foreign Office to proceed with the annexation. Sir Edward Grey concluded with his Volsky. He knew that the proposed action would deeply offend Serbia, and both had agreed that she would be due compensation. This being so, the secret elite knew exactly what was being proposed and precisely what his Volsky was doing. On October 6th, Emperor Franz Joseph announced that Bosnia-Herzegovina had been annexed. 
With its accustomed two-faced approach to transparency, the British government proclaimed that it was unacceptable for any country to alter a treaty unilaterally. A flurry of diplomatic protests followed. Inside the provinces themselves, the diverse population of Greek Orthodox Christians, Muslims, and other Christian sects promised a dangerous mix of ethnic protest. Isvalski fanned the flame of the Balkan nationalism. Serbia mobilized its army on, sev on the 7th of October and demanded that the annexation be reversed, or failing that, she should receive compensation. When Serbia called for Russian military support, Arenthal publicly revealed of Izvolsky's involvement in the secret deal. Alexander Izvolsky was undone. If he had hoped that diplomatic protocol would protect his anonymity, he was very disappointed. He blamed Arenthal, Arenthal defaming him in a racist outburst worthy of any anti-Semitic Russian. The dirty Jews has deceived me. He lied to me. He bamboozled me. That frightful Jew. Izvolsky had put his career on the line by giving Russia's consent to annexation without the knowledge or approval of the Tsar or his government and tried to blame it all on an Austrian Jew. Russia had not received from her devastating defeat by Japan and, embarrassed by Izvolsky's involvement in her military weakness, declined to intervene. Some historians believe that a European war would have broken out in 1908 had the Russian military been at full strength. Instead, the Ser Serbians were deflated. Without the anticipated Russian support, they had no option but to pull back from the brink. But a bitter bait, a bitter rage, a bitter rage burned in their bellies against their powerful Austro-Hungarian neighbors. As Volsky's counseled Serbia to accept what had happened with the chilling advice that they should prepare for f future action. Revenge has always been a dish best served cold. Thanks to Izvolsky's activities on behalf of the secret elite masters, their mission was accomplished. The Balkans had been successfully stirred, and Austria-Hungary emerged as public enemy number one. Izvolsky was not working to his own agenda, he could have he could not have seriously believed that the eternal conundrum of a warm water port for Russia would be solved by his subterfuge. Given the eighteen seventy eight Treaty of Berlin, there was no possibility that Germany, France, Britain, Italy, Austria, Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire would grant joint approval for such a radical move. Wars had been fought for far less, and that was a point that Izvolsky must have understood. It did, however, point the way forward. The secret elite, the foreign office, and Sir Edward Grey all knew how important Constantinople was to the Russians. Its gift was not in their hands, but the promise of it was a tantalizing carrot they may have. They had every intention of dangling before the Russians at the right moment. Izvolsky had, had been sold short at every turn. Mocked in, Saint Be mocked in St. Petersburg as the Prince of the Bosphorus, he faced dismissal and political oblivion, but his patron, King Edward, whose direct influence had raised him to foreign minister, stepped in once more on his behalf. The king wrote personally to his nephew, the Tsar, reiterating his confidence in Izvolsky and his hope that he would remain in office, he did for the moment. Undeterred, Izvolsky continued to stir the Balkan pop on behalf of his real masters. In a speech to the Russian parliament, he advised the Balkan states to federate and encourage the greater Ser Serbian policy aimed at the expulsion of Austria from the Balkan Peninsula. In December of 1909, a secret military convention was concluded between Russia and the recently independent Bulgaria. Its fifth clause stated, The realization of the high ideals of the Slav people in the Balkan Peninsula 
which are so closely at heart at Russia's heart, is only possible after a fortunate issue in the struggle of Russia and Germany and Austria Hungary. In other words, war. Victory over victory over Germany and Austria Hungary was now the key to the realization of all their ambitions. The secret elite had reached into the very heart of Tsarist Russia and a touch paper was set that would later find the murderous spark. Izvolsky Isvol condemned the Balkans to six tortured years of miserable infighting, but he should not be seen as the real perpetrator. He was simply another foreign representative of the secret elite who financed his lifestyle through their London and Paris banks. In many ways, the first part of this, the first part of his mission had been completed when he successfully demonstrated that war with Germany was the only route that Russia could take to the Straits of Constantinople. The military intent of all three members of the Triple Entente was thus harmonized through Russia's ambition to gain the Straits. France drive, France's drive to regain Alsace-Lorraine and Britain's master plan to throttle Germany. The three-pronged spear was thrust towards the heart of the continental Europe. What the secret elite had so successfully achieved was startlingly, was startlingly, startlingly, what the secret elite had so successfully achieved was startlingly clever. The Balkan countries now had cause to fear that they might be the next target for Austrian annexation, while Russia had yet more proof that she could not act alone in any European intervention. An indebted Izvolsky was even more dependent on the support and financial largess of his London masters. Thanks to King Edwards, he rode the storm at home. As far as the secret elite was concerned, as far as the secret elite were concerned, Izvolsky had performed well. A gaping, a gaping chasm, a gaping chasm, had developed between Russia and Austro-Hungarian Empire. Prior to 1908, relationships between Saint Petersburg and Vienna had been good, especially in regard to the Balkans. Izvolsky single. Izvolsky's actions single-handedly turned friendship into complete estrangement. Summary, Chapter 8, Alexander Izvolsky, Hero and Villain Despite widespread objection from MPs and the public, the secret elite pursued their objective to bring Russia into an entente by sending the king to Reval to meet the Tsar in 1908 of June, even although it broke with accepted protocol in diplomatic circles. King Edward took his secret advisors, members of the Committee of Imperial Defense, to liaise, to liaise, to liaise with, to liaise with Prime Minister Stolypin, and Foreign Minister Alexander Volsky. The result was an agreement, sometimes called the Anglo-Russian Convention, that dealt on the surface with issues about Persia, Afghanistan, and Tibet, but effectively isolated Germany and extended plans to go to war with Germany. Izvolsky, who was in the pay of the secret elite, plotted with them behind the Tsar's back before the meeting and was later credited with concluding in a matter of weeks both the Entente and the alliance with Japan. Izvolsky's clandestine meeting with the Austrian counterpart, Erenthal, or Erenthal, Erenthal, which made Russia complicit in the annexation of Bosnia, was managed by the secret elite. Serbia called on Russian help to go to war against Austria, but the Austrians unmasked Izvolsky's role in the affair and the Russians had to step back. 
Isvalsky was ridiculed in the Russian press, but his position as foreign secretary was saved through the personal intervention of King Edward. Isvalsky continued to stir the Balkan states against Germany and Austria-Hungary. He encouraged a greater Serbia movement based on revenge and advised them to prepare for future action. The secret elite gained grounds on several levels. The Triple Entente was cemented. The Balkans were stirred into a hornet's nest of nationalists and sec sectarian suspicion and bitterness. Russia realized that the only route to the Straits was through a successful war against Germany and no longer trusted Austria-Hungary. <laughs>